Okay, this is going to be a short overview of the four main leukemias that are important to know. Uh, we start off here with a slide showing some of the main symptoms of leukemias in general. We see that leukemias affect all parts of the body, mainly because blood, uh, our blood is taken all over the body, and leukemia is, of course, a cancer of the blood. So we see stomach, lung, muscular, bones, joints, lymph nodes, spleen, uh, all over, symptoms all over. The four leukemias that we're going to be talking about are chronic myelogenous leukemia, also called chronic myeloid leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, also called chronic lymphoid leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, also called acute myelogenous leukemia. You can see that the M's and the L's here are, are switched up quite a bit. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and uh, the, the main thing to remember here is that two of these are chronic, two of these are acute, and that kind of affects their presentation. Um, and then a different two are myelogenous. They affect one side of the lineage more than the other, and the others are uh, lymphoid. So those will affect the lymphoid side of the development pathway of a blood cell. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So CML, CLL, AML, and ALL. Let's jump right into it. We're going to start with chronic myelogenous leukemia. This is a neoplasm of a progenitor stem cell. This is the only one that is a, a, a cancer of a stem cell that's very high up in the chain uh, of, of stem cell development. And this is considered a myeloproliferative disease. So in the same category as like P. vera, as, uh, as ET, as, um, as, as other diseases like that. One of the big differences with CML is that the malignant cells can still differentiate. And this leads to seeing morphological heterogeneity. This means that when we take a blood smear of somebody with CML, we're going to see different kinds of cells, different kinds of mature cells even on that slide. So the cancerous cells are stem cells, first of all, and they can still differentiate. So we're going to see increased numbers of many different kinds of cells. We're going to see heterogeneity. Somebody comes in with CML, they're going to have usually ambiguous symptoms, fevers, sweats, weight loss, some systemic things. They could even be asymptomatic. I think it's something like 40% of patients uh, with this are asymptomatic. This is a disease of old people, not, not too old, but it occurs in adults with a median age of 66. Uh, we often see large livers and large spleens, and this is due to extramedullary production of, of cells, of blood cells. On the, uh, on the lab report, we might see high white count, specifically the, granu uh, the granulated white blood cells. So we're going to see high neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. We're going to see low uh, red blood cells, so slightly anemic, and usually high platelets. High platelets is one to remember with CML. It's the only one of these four that has high platelets. So CML so far has been unique in that it's heterogeneous, in that it's a neoplasm of the very top stem cell and high platelets. One of the big translocations here is 922. This is worth remembering. This is called the Philadelphia chromosome. It makes a gene product called BCR ABLE. It's a fusion protein and it codes for a tyrosine kinase. This tyrosine kinase is oncogenic and it leads to the mass division and mass production of these cells. But of course, there's a treatment for it. Uh, we'll get into that in, in a couple bullets, I guess. So big translocation, T. 922. So the Philadelphia chromosome actually refers to the small 22 chromosome that has a piece of 9 translocated onto it. We can look for this 922 translocation with fish. Uh, alternatively, we can look for the BCR able transcript, that whole fusion protein with PCR. So that's how we diagnose CML. Chronic phase accelerates into the blast phase. This is the progression of CML. And we're going to talk about how CML might lead to AML and ALL. Most of the time it leads to AML. Uh, but it's when it does lead to ALL, it's pretty bad. The treatment is imatinib. So we said that the problem, the oncogenic gene was a tyrosine kinase. Imatinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, and this, of course, treats it. That's a pretty good treatment, very good prognosis for people who take imatinib. The only cure for CML is, uh, is an allogeneic stem cell transplant, which has all kinds of side effects, all kinds of problems with immunity and graft versus host disease. Uh, so imatinib is a pretty good treatment. Now, here's the branching of uh, the, the, the differentiation of a stem cell. We see that we start up here with a multi-potential uh, stem cell, and that's exactly the site of the mutation in CML. So we can see why we see a heterogeneous population on the blood smear, and there should be a blood smear right there. We see all kinds of cells here. We see some lymphoid cells, some granulocytes, and of course all the red blood cells. Uh, might even see a few macrophages on there, but we see heterogeneous cells on the blood smear. On the, on the right here, we see the results of the fish assay. Um, we have 
the the yellow or the white excuse me the green and the red coding for bcr and able uh, it might not be in that order but one or the other and then you see that yellow dot over there is where bcr and able are in the same area that's an indication that we have fusion protein bcr able coding for that tyrosine kinase uh the the oncogenic tyrosine kinase so this is a positive fish assay for cml All right, next one we have is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. This is a malignancy of mature B cells as opposed to a stem cell as well as um, in CML. So <clears throat> these are fully differentiated cells. There's homogeneity and it's clonal. So homogeneity means that you're gonna see all one type of cell on the blood smear. You won't see the different kinds like we did in CML. Clonal means that they're all B cells, they're all naive, so they haven't been exposed to antigen yet, but they're all expressing the same light chain. And we'll see, uh, we'll see, we'll, we'll talk about how to, how to diagnose and how to ensure that it's clonal when looking for CLL. Somebody comes in with CLL, they're going to have same ambiguous symptoms, fever, night sweats, weight loss. It occurs in adults. Uh, this is an even older population, median age of 72. We see hepatosplenomegaly here. We also see lymphadenopathy. So we're going to see lymph node involvement. This makes sense. It's a lymphocytic leukemia. Blood is going to be high white blood count, low red blood count, low platelets this time, and hypogammaglobulinemia. Now this is kind of tricky. We're going to have high white blood cells, but low white blood cell production. We're going to have low gamma globulinemia in the blood. And this leads to frequent infections, um, often by encapsulated bacteria that would normally be taken by taken care of by these white blood cells. Two associated conditions with this are autoimmune hemolytic anemia, AIHA, and immune thrombocytopenia. Uh, together, these are called Evans syndrome, and they both kind of have the same mechanism of action. The faulty immunoglobulins that are produced by the CLL cells are attacking the red blood cells and the platelets, respectively, causing them to be cleared by the immune system. So we see hemolytic, we see hemolytic anemia, specifically AIHA and ITP as well. On the blood smear, we also see spherocytes. That's a normal side effect of AIHA. And we see smudge cells, which are an artifact that are due to weakened structural integrity of the CLL cells. When smearing out the blood, we can smush the cells. They're more fragile than usual. On flow cytometry, the big positives we see here are CD5+, ZAP70, CD38+, and gamma or lambda chains. Now, it's important to note that we'd never see both gamma and lambda chains in CLL because it's a clonal disease. We're going to see one or the other. In a normal population of white blood cells, we'll see both gamma and lambda, and it's usually a 50-50 split. In this case, because it's a clonal disease, we're going to see gamma or lambda. Uh, I emphasize CD5 and ZAP70 because those are usually found on... Uh, normal T cells. In this case, we're looking at a malignancy of B cells, and we see those there. Uh, the 19, 20, and 23 are pretty normal on B cells, so that, that those should be pretty easy to remember. We see CD10 negative on CLL, which helps us differentiate it from follicular and Burkitt's lymphoma, and also ALL. We also see CD, or cyclin D1 negative, which helps us differentiate CLL from mantle cell. Rye classification is a way of staging CLL. It's pretty easy to remember. All the stages, 0 through 5, have leukocytosis. Stages 1, 2, 3, 4, add the symptoms LSAT, lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. So LSAT, like the test that lawyers take, are the stages 1, 2, 3, 4 of the Rye classification. There's no cure for CLL, but there's a pretty good long-term prognosis. There was a study that showed that the, uh, the treatment for CLL gives you pretty much the same prognosis as no treatment at all. So palliative care is, uh, is the best option for people with CLL. Now here we have that, that differentiation branch again, and CLL is a problem with the B lymphocyte that's pretty mature down there. So very different from the stem cell. And on CLL, if we look at this, uh, if, if we look at both of these smears, we see pretty homogeneous differentiation. We see all the same type of cell. These are all uh, lymphocyte, uh, lymphocytes, they're all B cells. And we see a couple of uh, smear cells on the right there too that got smushed in the making of the smear. Now let's jump into acute myeloid leukemia. Le acute myeloid leukemia is a problem with the myeloid progenitor. So it's not quite a fully differentiated cell like we saw in CLL. It's not quite the very first stem cell like we saw in CML. And I'll show you what that looks like on the branch in a second. There's a proliferation of these granulocyte blast cells. And it's important to remember that these blast cells cannot differentiate like they could in CML. So we're going to see homogeneity and it's going to be another clonal disease. The threshold for diagnosing AML is 20% blasts. If you have more than 20% blasts, 
then it's it's considered AML. Um, it's nice to remember that on the on the smear, the blasts look larger than the fully differentiated granulocytes. So these myeloid blasts are going to be slightly larger, and that helps you identify them. Another key defining point is the hour rods, which are small rod-shaped structures that are found inside the cell. These rod-shaped structures are made of MPO myeloperoxidase, which uh, you might remember is an enzyme found in granulocytes, particularly neutrophils when they encapsulate and re release a bunch of reactive oxygen species to break down uh, whatever they're eating, whatever bacteria they, they surrounded and, and phagocytized. MPO uh, is made too much. There's too much MPO here, so it's crystallized into these hour rods. And uh, this leaves us more susceptible to encapsulated bacteria infecting us, which can lead to DIC. Now, the clinical presentation for AML is high white blood cells, like all of these. Anemia, we have low neutrophils because the myeloid progenitors are not allowed to differentiate. And we also see low platelets, again, because the myeloid progenitors cannot differentiate. There's one key mutation with AML, and it's T1517. This leads to a particular kind of AML called APL, acute promyelocytic leukemia. Um, and this is a subset of AML. The protein made here is called RAR alpha. RAR is retinoic acid receptor, uh, which, is a, which is a receptor for retinoic acid, which allows us to differentiate from the progenitor stage to a, uh, a more mature cell. So the treatment for AML containing the T1517 translocation is treatment with ATRA, which stands for all trans retinoic acid. So it makes sense that if the, if the RA receptor is, uh, is disrupted, we could treat it with ATRA which is more RA, and there's usually a pretty good prognosis for this kind of AML. A different kind of AML results from an FLT3 mutation. This is not associated with any cyto, uh, cytogenic translocation. It's a de novo mutation. Um, you make abnormal amounts of a tyrosine kinase. There's a pretty bad prognosis for this, likely because there's no treatment. Some of the couple indicating factors for bad prognoses for AML are deletion of chromosomes 5 or 7, being old, or having AML that's uh, that evolved from another from another syndrome, such as CML evolving into AML. That's usually a pretty bad prognosis for AML. And treatment, previous treatments of chemotherapy and radiation, um, indicate that that the AML is going to be pretty bad. AML is in general curable. Um, I think the the rates of cure depend on how bad your prognosis is, as as noted in the previous bullet. Uh, there's a seven plus three chemotherapy where you have seven days of cytarabine and three days of anthracycline. Those are both two different kinds of chemo drugs. And there is a potential for allergic stem cell transplants in people with AML. Um, that of course depends on uh, your fitness, how long, how young you are, and uh, and a bunch of other factors to, to, to determine if you're a good candidate for, for stem cell transplant. So again, here we have that, that branch of differentiating blood cells. AML is a problem with this common myeloid progenitor, and it prevents us from making, from differentiating into this whole left side of these cells. We see a homogeneous population of blast cells. You can see that these blast cells are, on average, pretty much larger than the red blood cells that you see in the blood, and uh, and this this is a this is a result of them being halted of mass production at the progenitor stage, and uh, and essentially not being able to differentiate into, into platelets, into granulocytes, and into red blood cells as they usually would. All right, last one, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL. This is a malignancy of the lymphoid progenitor, so kind of like AML, but on the other side. Not quite the most differentiated cell, but not the very top stem cell. So we're going to see either B or T blast cell production. Again, you cannot differentiate. Again, homogeneity, and again, clonal. So clinically, looks like anemia, Looks like low neutrophils, low platelets, and hepatosplenomegaly. These are similar symptoms that we've seen before. Something new here is tumor lysis syndrome, which, uh, which is when a lot of your blood cells break open, releasing a bunch of calcium, excuse me, releasing a bunch of phosphate, uric acid, LDH, and phosphate. Uh, and the potassium, uric acid, and LDH are all contained in the cell. Phosphate is also released from the cell, which binds to calcium that's in the blood, causing low calcium. Um, all these symptoms associated with tumor lysis syndrome can lead to renal failure. You also see lymph node involvement, and this makes sense. It's a lymphoblastic leukemia, specifically in a mediastinal mass. That also makes sense, um, especially with T-cell production, T-blast cell production, as your, uh, as, your, as your thymus is in the mediastinal region, and that can get enlarged. This is the most common cancer in children. Peak age is two to five. Some risk factors are similar to those of AML, previous chemo and radiation, having Down syndrome, having uh, uh, neurofibromatosis, and a couple other syndromes that, um, that lead to a bad prognosis for ALL. 
and the B cell version of ALL. So there's a B cell version and a T cell version. B cell version is more common. It's easy to identify with CD10 plus and TDT plus. Um, the C C CD10 plus and TDT plus are two markers that, that help you know it's B cell ALL. And um, the CD19 and CD20 are on normal B cells, so those don't help as much. There's a good prognosis if it's a B cell ALL. Um, it's 85% of ALL cases are B cell ALLs, and you have a good prognosis, you have an even better prognosis if you're hyperdiploid, meaning you have more than 46 chromosomes, if you're between the ages of 1 and 10, or you have that 1221 translocation. You have a bad prognosis if you're hypodiploid, less than 46 chromosomes, have a white blood count that's pretty high, and have a translocation of 922. Remember, that's the same Philadelphia chromosome that we saw last time. T cell. ALL is less common. It uh, usually has a slightly worse prognosis and it's identifiable as a thymic mass in teenagers. So thymic mass, T cell, so T cells reside in the thymus, cause the thymus to enlarge, happens in teenagers. Um, and, and that's usually a worse condition than the BALL. So real quick, let's end it off with where the ALL happens in the common lymphoid progenitor and it halts the production of those more mature lymphoid blood cells. I think that's all we got. This has been a pretty quick summary of the four main leukemias. Thanks for listening.